Bob Gallagher has the real estate market covered. This is Real Estate Matters with Bob Gallagher. Welcome back. You're listening to Real Estate Matters here on the Money Matters Radio Network. I'm your host, Bob Gallagher. Joined in studio today by my co-host, Pete DeMore. How you doing, Pete? Uh, Bob, just fabulous. Beautiful day out there. Yes, it is. And we have a very special guest in the studio with us today, Michael Carucci, Executive Vice President of Gibson Sotheby's International Realty in Boston. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hi, guys. So we invited you here to tell us a little bit about what's going on in the Boston market. You know, we hear all sorts of things, us being out on the 495 end of town. Uh, we hear all sorts of craziness about how quick things are selling, all the extra, you know, uh, multiple offers, selling way over asking price. Why don't you give us a little feel for what's going on in, inside the city right now? Well, we're obviously having some supply side problems and mm. the demand with uh, Boston being so uh, diversified economically and uh, job wise and the cost of money being so low. Mm -hmm. You just have an awful lot of people ch chasing after quality assets. So are you seeing issues with inventory across all ends of the spectrum or is it more the high end or low end that you're having issues with? I think uh, across most price points. I mean, the super high end is always, always going to have its limitations on, mm -hmm. you know, clearly, because of its price point. But pretty right. much the entire market is vibrant. And you actually do a lot of business in the in the super high end, correct? I do, yes. One of your specialties? Yes. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about the super high end in Boston right now? Have you seen it improve over the last couple of years, or has it always been kind of kind of even? It's we are going off the charts on price per square foot. I mean, we really? have some things now up at four and five thousand dollars a square foot. That's unheard of. Wow. I mean, you had benchmarks in the 80s. It was the threshold was two hundred dollars a square foot and then you hit five hundred dollars a square foot and then there was a thousand dollars a square foot and then there's fifteen hundred and it just keeps going up. And it seems like there's no limit. It's apparently right now. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> there probably is somewhere, but we haven't yeah. hit it yet. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what so about especially for the trophy pieces? Yeah. And can you give us an example of what a trophy piece would be? Is it well, I think there was a listing last week at the old Ritz Carlton, uh, two car Mav. I think that was twelve million dollars, five thousand dollars a square foot. Uh, wow! Somewhere wow! There. Twelve um, million dollars. There's another one that just came out at the Heritage, uh, Dan Mullen, great broker. That's I think that's three, four thousand dollars a square foot. Wow! Some of the units at the Four Seasons that are about to come on will be hitting the two and three thousand dollars square foot plateaus. And there's uh, there's a new. See, uh, four seasons coming on line yes, there right? Is. Yeah. How far away yeah. is that, do you think? Uh, two years, two to three years. Two years. And how, do you know how many units approximately in that building? I, I don't know. No, yeah. John Tracy Campion, Campion and Company, great companies doing the marketing. Wow. And, uh, they're probably going to be 2,700 to 3,500 a foot. Which puts it in what, the three to four million dollar range? Or I, plus? I don't know the exact unit sizes, but yeah. my guess is at a minimum, you know, 1,200 feet and probably up to five, 6,000 feet. Wow. And we were talking before we got started today about uh, condo fees when you're moving into those kind of a building or those kind of buildings. What are you, kind of, what are you getting for the money? Because we talked about crazy numbers like three, 4,000 up to 10,000 a month just for your condo fees, never mind taxes and the, the other carrying costs of the building. Well, in the full, full service buildings, you, you know, obviously you have the concierge, you have room service, you have the hotel amenities, mm -hmm. uh, and some of the other, we'd call it sub full service buildings, always, you know, v valet parking, concierge services. Mm -hmm. um, it varies, you know, building to building. Right. And one of the other things we talked about, which Pete and I found really interesting, was the parking situation in Boston. You were talking about people paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for parking spaces, and you, you mentioned one place they haven't had a sale in five years. You got people lined up waiting. Yeah, Brimmer Street Garage. Wow. Yeah. And is that typical of all well, of downtown Boston, or is well, it more just that area? It 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 runs in pockets, and mm. the pockets are defined by the luxury buildings around those pockets. And put, let's put it this way: if you're going to spend four, five, six million dollars on a property, and you need that extra parking space, or it's two hundred thousand dollars. That's a good point. Yeah. A small house out in the suburbs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like you said, it's five or six it's, million. It's, it's relative. Yeah, it really is. Wow. Uh, now, one of the things, the other things we talked about was uh, the real estate brands that are growing and where that's kind of going as an industry. What, what do you see happening there, Michael? Well, I mean, you've got some local companies, Lair in particular, doing mm -hmm. an amazing job uh, recruiting, keeping quality controls in place. And then you've got a lot of talk about what Berkshire Hathaway is doing. And, you know, anytime Warren Buffett touches something, people pay attention. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you've got Sotheby's, of course, which we merged with a few weeks ago. You know, those are brands that you just you have to look at. I think there is a consolidation. I think what you're seeing, to, to, in my opinion, to be effective is you need to be really small boutique mm -hmm. or really large with a brand. I think um, those mid-level companies are, are going to have a tough time. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see, especially when you see a guy like Warren Buffett uh, 
throw money into real estate. Uh, there's rumors going around that his plan is basically to be, have a hand in everything that has anything to do with real estate, from the purchase of it, financing it, furnishing it, uh, working on it. I mean, he wants to control it all. There is a master plan with him, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess when you look at it, when you look at when somebody actually buys a house, all the different people that are affected by it. I mean, who doesn't buy new furniture when they move into a house or hire contractors to do some kind of work? I mean, when you look at it, it's, a, it's an economic engine. No question. So why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, the luxury high rises uh, in Boston right now, especially the rentals. You know, we're, Pete and I have been reading these articles in Banker and Tradesman about somewhere between three and 7,000 uh, luxury rentals coming on the market between now and I think it was maybe four years from now. And they're already saying that we're kind of getting to the point where the market is, I don't want to say saturated, but it's definitely slowing down a little bit as far as renters are concerned. What do you think is going to happen there? Well, I mean, there, to an extent, there may be some cannibalizing on, yeah. on the tenants. Um, but I also think that some of these buildings were originally f- could only be financed as apartments. And so and by the time they were and underwritten and financed to actually getting built, the market picked up. So I think you'll see some of these units actually being converted to condominiums. And I think that the, mm-hmm. the, the banks will allow that. Um, it, you know, it's it's going to depend on jobs and, and, and growth and, you know, who, you know, who's going to live in these apartments. Right. Right. And, of course, you've still got the massive shortage, massive shortage of uh, affordable housing. I mean, affordable these days. I mean, if you're if you're making one hundred thousand dollars a year, can you even afford to live in the city? Yeah, it's a it's a big problem. Yeah. Uh, and you've got, uh, you know, got great companies locally here like Wind Development. I mean, they they invented 40B for, for the most part. And you know, there's a conscious effort to try to create workforce ho- workforce housing, and and affordable housing. Uh, the, the the challenges are that it cannot come without state and federal subsidies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess if you're the developer and you can sell it for top dollar, if there's not a lot of incentive there to sell it cheaper. Uh, I read something again in Banker and Tradesman a, a few weeks ago about uh, the new mayor's plan to come up with. I want to say it was thirty thousand affordable housing units in the next fifteen years. Yeah, I think Marty's doing a great job. I yeah. think you know the, the challenge is uh, you know the acquisition and you know finding finding land, building yeah. it at a reasonable cost, and nothing can get done without subsidies. Though it just one and one does not equal two. That's when true. When you're looking at that equation. That's true. Of course, then you've you've also got the people that don't want the affordable housing units in their neighborhood because they see it as a something that's going to detract from values. Right. So unfortunately, kind of an uphill <clears throat> uphill battle for uh, for all that. But it has to happen. I mean, you can't have people working in hotels commuting from Springfield to work every day. It just it won't happen. And back to workforce housing. For yeah, sure. absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit about the market on Newbury Street. That's always interesting for us. Well. I, we do a lot of business on Newbury Street, so we sort of know it firsthand. Um, it's uh, you know we are trading at two and two, three and four caps. So um, I think that Newbury Street over the last few years has been more. The acquisitions have been more about capital preservation mm-hmm. and returns. I think, and uh, I can tell you the last handful of buildings I've sold on Newbury Street, it's all been pension funds. It's just protecting capital and really? uh, more so than you know getting reasonable rates of return. Because you read about you know these longtime businesses that have been there being forced out because the the owner's selling because he can't pass up the 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 price he's being offered. You know it's it's unfortunate, but that's what happens. Um, another thing, um, there's been a huge increase in real estate taxes in the last year mm-hmm. in the Newbury Street, Boylston areas, and a lot of these tenants are on triple net leases, so they're responsible for those increases. I've heard stories of rents doubling because just of the real estate taxes yeah and uh, you know these are small businesses that um that hits their sure. profit margin that's the difference in whether yeah. they have to lay somebody Ec- off. economically they just can't stay in the business right. anymore mm-hmm. and yeah. it happened when we had the worst winter in what 60 years yeah. yeah yeah i i actually um when i lived in natick uh my wife and i used to go to um the Forum. It was a restaurant. I right. don't think it was on Newbury Street, but it was. Oh, no, it just closed. It so closed right on the right on the marathon. Yeah, line. and it closed because of that that reason that the uh, the rents, the taxes, and the rent went up to a point where it just didn't make financial sense for them to stay open. Uh, that's not necessarily true. Really? No, um, that's that's not really what happened. Oh, can you share? Um, I think there was an increase in the rent, but it was nothing what you read about. Really? I'm, I'm very friendly with the owner. Oh, and, uh, he's a reasonable guy. Yeah. Well, it's a it was a uh, great restaurant. They that company happens to own several other restaurants, so I'm sure they're doing doing fine. Yeah. Um, what else about the downtown Boston real estate market? 
What's going on with uh, – you talked about the ultra-high-end uh, trophy properties. Anything interesting on the market right now? Well, we've got a couple of homes in Brookline that we've just listed in the $7 million range, which is – Wow. Very beautiful homes. Um, I mentioned uh, in the Boston market, uh, the property of the Heritage that came on, the property of the Old Ritz Carlton. There's a couple of the Four Seasons coming on at substantial numbers. Mm. You know, it's uh, some of these properties, they don't come on the market for 20, 30, 40 years. It's just you know, yeah. they're coming on at, at, at the right time, and brokers are doing their job and pushing the levels of pricing and seeing what what they can get. Yeah. What kind of a house do you get in uh in that area for seven seven million dollars um if you look if you looked right now in brookline for instance i believe there's five homes over five million between five million and 18 million and the last time we checked i think it was the, on average eight hundred dollars a square foot the, the homes that we have we have one that's 7.3 million that's ten thousand square feet so it's seven hundred and thirty dollars a square foot we have another one wow. that's brand new that's seven and a half million at seventy one hundred square feet so that's like a thousand dollars somewhere around a thousand dollars a foot so wow. it varies from a low end of seven hundred to eight hundred a foot to a high end of uh i think there's one on for 18 million that's thirteen hundred a foot wow and at those price points, obviously, they've, they've been renovated if, if they're really older properties. In, or, in some cases. Yeah. And remember, though, those price points, I think the average days on market on those homes were 200, 250 days. Wow. So it, it, it takes some time. Yeah. I mean, you're not doing broker open houses and public open houses on homes like that. <laughs> no, no. no, no. The, 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 what do you think the percent of the people out there uh, could, be, could be or would be interested in a, in a house for that value? Five percent of the one percent. Five percent of the one yeah. percent. Yes. So it's not a lot. That's not a lot. Not of a lot. No, there's always yeah. a hand. You know, there's a handful of um, there's a handful of people in that price range, but mm. they can afford to spend that kind of money. They they do their due diligence and they're certainly yeah. uh, in tune with the market. Yeah. And would you say that those people that are buying at that price point, it's their primary residence here, or is it just one of many houses they own? It's one of many houses. Yeah. Almost always. So it's a place they come to stay when they're in the city, basically. Almost always. Yeah. Well, that, that's probably a nice way to live. Although, you never really have a place to call home either. It must be kind of tough. You call multiple places home. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a very someday good point. Someday it could be you and I, Bob. <laughs> someday. 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 Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, marketing properties? Uh, what are the difference, differences between marketing a higher-end property versus a, you know, the median uh, property in, in the neighborhoods that you you work in well like i mentioned earlier on the higher end you're certainly not doing open houses and it's no. really target marketing and you know you're going after sea level positions and mm -hmm. um and uh, so you're, you're focused on you know who the best fit is for the property on the the mid-level properties you just you get it out there you get it out in social media you get it out in, in print and uh you let as many people know that it's out there. Mm -hmm. And you use social media more for marketing than anything else these days? Because we talked a little bit about how print just doesn't really get the job done anymore. I don't, I don't even know who reads newspapers anymore. Um, sellers. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that's, it, that's it. They want to see their price yeah. in the in the in uh, yeah. their piece of property in the yeah. paper. Yeah, exactly. I think that's clearly social media is here to stay. And as we discussed earlier, what's really coming on is, is video mm -hmm. and the YouTube and uh showcasing properties like this but you know social media brands you and it brands you i, I can tell you we we just listed a th three and a half million dollar property in chestnut hill and the woman found us through social media really? so, it, it, so it works without a doubt really yeah. and what kind of do you do video marketing through social media do you we've do just started to do that um yeah but it's it's new to us but we've done you know facebook linkedin twitter i mean we've Every morning in between, when we have people that just handle social media for us, people can constantly tell me how great my social media is, and I sometimes tell them I don't do it because I don't. So I have people to do it for me. Right. Um, but it works. I mean, it, you, you, get, you, you get the message out there every day. Yeah. It's just a different way of advertising now. Like yeah. you said, it's targeted right. versus taking out ads in papers that uh, right. just don't really go anywhere anymore. We, we, we do a, you know, one of the things that we do is we... we um, we focus on super high-end print, like Boston Common Magazine or mm -hmm. Nantucket Magazine or Rob Report, because those still those types of magazines still have a very high touch feel to um, high net worth individuals. So I think that's one of the few print places that we find still effective. Very good, very good. And how about um, you know going back to the higher-end properties because that's kind of your specialty? Uh, what's the? Can you share with us what the the highest pro highest value that you've sold in say the last two years would be? Well, I did the in the famous Daisy Buchanan's last year on Newbury Street. That was fifteen million. Wow! And is that uh, that's a bar? 
or it's was a building. A bar? It's a building at 240A Newbury Street. Mm-hmm. Um, been there for an awful long time. It was originally owned by Derek Sanderson of the Bruins. Wow. Some history there? A lot of history there, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, we did some things in Brookline next to America's favorite quarterback, uh, five and six million dollar range. So Wow. We, um, we, we've had some good years. That's great. That's great. So you do uh, commercial and residential? I do, yes. That's great. I'm going to give out your contact info, Michael. Again, it's uh, Michael Carucci, Executive Vice President of Gibson Sotheby's International Realty. Uh, best way to get a hold of him is uh, cell phone, which is 617-901-7600. Again, that cell phone number is 617-901-7600. Or you can look him up online at uh, gibsonsotherbeesrealty.com. Uh, that's all for today. Well, that's all for this, uh, this segment of the show. We've got, um, we've got Stacy Elkhorn coming up in the final segment with us today with leaders and legends. Stay tuned. We've got to take a break for some, for some commercials. We'll be back with more after this.